So um, welcome everyone to this uh, sixth episode in a series of webinars showcasing the uses and benefits of Copernicus, uh, the, uh, the Earth Observation component of the EU Space Program. My name is Sofia Otero-Gomono. I'm part of the Copernicus Support Office and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, this uh, sixth webinar looks at how Copernicus data can be used for monitoring and measuring the impact of sustainable development policies. I should mention that this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared on the Copernicus EU uh, YouTube channel. Now, to make the webinar a bit more interactive, uh, we will be using Slido, uh, which I apologize, we have to um, set it up. There we go, we had some difficulties at the beginning, so there we go. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying, uh, we will be we will be using Slido um, to make this uh, webinar a bit more interactive. And the idea is that uh, you can ask your questions uh, through um, through this um, through this app, which you can access uh, either through WebEx or uh, through a link that I will share with you right away. And uh, also, just to start things up, uh, we are also going to be using Slido to ask you some questions. Let me share with you on the chat the link. And our first question, which you should be able to see uh, right now, it's uh, what sector do you currently work or study in? So to begin, let's go uh, through the agenda for today. Uh, we will have uh, three presentations from experts in the field. Uh, we'll have a presentation from Ana Maria Ribeiro de Sousa from the European Environment Agency, another presentation by Tina Zilovic from Mercator Ocean International, and finally, a presentation by Michele Menchiori from the European Commission Joint Research Centre. Following, following each one of these presentations, there will be opportunities for questions from the audience. Uh, so feel free to type in your questions on Slido or on the chat. Now, I'm going to give you some more time for answering questions. So I think we can go uh, to our first presentation today. Our first speaker is Ana Maria Ribeiro de Sousa. Ana Maria is an environmental engineer working for the European Environment Agency since 2005. She's responsible for the product group of, of the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service called Priority Area Monitoring, which includes several products such as the Urban Atlas, Coastal and Riparian Zones, as well as the Natura 2000 Land Cover Land Use product. Ana Maria, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really, really sorry that my camera is not working. I can't figure out uh, why. So you will have to do without me uh, on camera. Uh, but uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I can't really say what, what is not for, uh, working. Uh, but I start by thanking the organization for this invitation to join the webinar. And we will be discussing how Copernicus data can be used for supporting sustainable uh, development and to achieve the sustainable development goals. And I, I will start with a bit of context because I, I also needed to do that for myself and for organizing uh, this presentation in, in the most productive way uh, for me and for you since uh, I'm not an SDG expert at all. And uh, I suspect that everyone knows this is a, an easy number to get that the sustainable development goals are 17 and they relate to a social aspect, to economic uh, aspects, and also environmental aspects. Uh, that slide is okay for, and I will tell you when you should move on. Um, but now it gets more complex because the 17 goals have 169 associated targets, and the, these targets are assessed through indicators. And there could be one indicator per target, but there could be also two or three. So, Conclusion, there is a lot of indicators out there, and there's also a lot of potential for Copernicus to fit into some of these indicators. And there is, however, a difference that I wanted to highlight between the EUN SDGs and the EU SDGs, because the EU SDG indicator set is aligned, but uh, is not identical to the EUN list of global indicators. 
and this allows that the EU SDG indicators to focus on monitoring EU policies that are uh, relevant in the European context. So if we go back to 2018, there was an exercise that looked at the Copernicus services and tried to identify those that could contribute to monitor the SDGs. And I will highlight uh, only a few um, uh, that uh, refer to the land monitoring service. Uh, I would like to explain here one thing, which is the Copernicus land monitoring service is uh, implemented by two institutions. So the European Environment Agency, where I work, deals with what is called the pan-European and the local component, and the JRC is responsible for the global component. So uh, next, there should be an arrow coming up. Yes, thank you. Uh, the land service was identified for SDG 2, Zero Hunger, because the global uh, service offers information that helps predict, uh, predict crop yields. Uh, but I can also say that the Pan-European service that will soon offer uh, also a crop uh, type uh, service. Uh, the next, uh, then we move to um, also the land service for SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation, uh, because uh, why was it identified? It was because the global service provides near real-time information on inland water bodies. But I can also say here that the Pan-European service also offers a water layer that is now in production. And finally, next, uh, so last uh, arrow, yes, uh, the land service also, uh, was also identified for SDG 15, which is life on land, which is where I will concentrate on now. Uh, next, please. The 2022 edition of the monitoring report on progress towards the SDGs uh, in the EU context that was published by Eurostat so last year. Uh, it provides a quantitative assessment of the progress of the European Union towards reaching the SDGs that were identified in the European Union context. And the report is based on a set of around 100 indicators that have been selected, selected uh, considering several aspects like policy relevance from a EU perspective, as well as uh, availability, country coverage, data freshness, and quality. Now, looking at SDG 15 in particular, uh, it seeks to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, and among others, to halt biodiversity loss. And I have highlighted halt biodiversity loss on purpose because this will be my hook to make the link to CLMS, so the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, and one uh, product in particular. Now, how do we halt biodiversity loss? Well, I don't know, but there's a lot that should be done. But what I know is that the first thing we have to do is to start by monitoring what is happening within a certain habitat or within a certain species or an ecosystem. Uh, next, please. The Copernicus Land Monitoring Service offers one product. So we were talking about monitoring biodiversity and the Copernicus Service offers one product that was designed to monitor biodiversity. And it is included in a wider group of products called Priority Area Monitoring that Sophia already mentioned. We have products designed to monitor urban areas. We have products designed to monitor riparian zones, coastal zones, and we have, next please, uh, one that has, is dedicated to Natura 2000 sites, and we call it M2K. So we have four products within this group of uh, priority area monitoring. And monitoring of Natura 2000 sites was a request from DG Environment, one of our users, because Natura is the instrument uh, that was designed to halt the decline of biodiversity by protecting certain habitats and certain species. And within the Tura 2000 sites, that are many, there are thousands across Europe, the decision was to concentrate on a particular habitat type, the grasslands habitat type. And this was also a request from the G environment. So we tried to shape our products on the basis of the assessment of the user needs uh, from our users, in this case, the DG environment. And the basis of this product, so the end to get product, is Annex 1 of the Habitat Directive that identifies 32 um, grassland habitats that need to be protected. Uh, next, please. 
Uh, and you might think, why grass ones? Why did we choose grass ones? Well, the grass ones have a high ecological and uh, uh, landscape value. And also because they are at risk. We know that uh, they are facing an overall decline in terms of extent uh, and also in terms of biodiversity. So they are becoming less and less biodiverse. Uh, if we look at the State of Nature report that collects the member states reporting under the nature directives, it tells us that uh, grasslands show deteriorating trends. So the assessment has told us that uh, almost half have bad status, 14% have poor status, and managed grasslands are in a particularly bad status. So in terms of trends, we know that 51% of grasslands are classified as deteriorating, and only only 7% of grasslands show an improving trend. Next, please. Uh, with the next slide, I'll, I will be showing you an example of how the product, uh, the product looks like. Uh, we have mapped more than 4,000 sites across Europe, uh, so quite a lot, but there's still more to come in the next exercise for the 2021 reference year. Uh, and we have mapped three timestamps, 2006, 12, and 18. We also map a uh, buffer zone of two kilometers surrounding the site. And this is what gives us the opportunity later on to uh, do an assessment inside and outside the site. I will talk about it later. So we offer a time series of land cover land use products, mapping the changes within these two periods, 6, 12, and, and 12, 18. We also offer high spatial resolution because the minimum mapping unit of the product is half an hectare, and it is based on very high resolution satellite imagery, uh, typically between two and a half and four meter, uh, four meters uh, pixel size. So quite detailed uh, input data for this product. We also offer very detailed delineation of landscape objects, which because of the minimum mapping unit, uh, we can do that. Um, and we also offer a great thematic richness because we have uh, devised a tailored nomenclature with 55 classes. But to map 55 classes, this means that the product is mostly a visual interpretation of product with a lot of in situ information to support the interpretation. But so far until, uh, until now, we will look into it in the future, but so far only the human eye and the human brain can identify so many, so many with different classes. Uh, next, please. So, what did we do with this product? Besides um, producing it and making it available for the public, we also did an assessment of the changes occurring inside and outside the site. And this assessment of changes confirmed what we already knew from the expert assessment reported in the State of Nature report. So, we have proof with the GIS data set to confirm what was reported by the experts, uh, the members in the member states. And what, what is that is, is that grasslands are facing an overall decline in the EU, but to a lesser extent within the Natura 2000 site. So this data showed us high dynamics in the urban and grassland classes, that urban areas show the highest growth, that grassland is substantially lost over both reference periods, and the main reasons for the grassland loss that we identified in the period 2012-2018 are conversion to cropland, 36%, urbanization, 22%, and tree encroachment, 14%. So the conclusion was of this assessment that uh, good work is being done within Natura 2000 sites to uh, lessen the, the decline of the grassland areas. However, there is more work that is required to protect these uh, valuable habitats. The summary of the assessment will contain a few more details that I did not mention here with only this, uh, this slide. But if you want to have a look at it, it is available in the Copernicus Observer and uh, one article that was published in 2021. And you can find the link in the slide. So to be clear, we do not provide an indicator directly used in the SDGs, but we provide a data set meant to monitor grassland habitats in Natura 2000 sites. Therefore, I would say in an indirect way, supporting sustainable development policies with evidence-based knowledge. Next, please. 
Uh, I would like to finish by uh, showing one other example of uh, uh, CLMS products, uh, the high resolution layer impervious net, so HRL imp, um, that is used to build an indicator as well under uh, FTG 15, so iPhone 1. It is the soil sealing index that estimates the increase in sealed soil surfaces. However, due to a break in the time series in 2018, the assessment of progress was not possible because until 2015, we were using a pixel size of 20 meters in 2018, of 10 meters. So it might look like there was a lot of increase of imperviousness, but the fact that was that some of it was not, were not captured in 2015 because of the pixel size, but they were already there. So to, um, to address this, we are currently working on a workaround on a method to reconstruct the time series. This is a concrete example of a CLMS product being used uh, to build an indicator. And uh, I think you can move to the last slide. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I would just um, like to conclude by making a few statements and a few suggestions. Uh, I would like to state that Copernicus Design Service provides evidence-based knowledge for improving the reporting and for supporting sustainable development policies, which is what we are talking about here. And there is a huge potential in CLMS data to address other SDGs. And I, um, and I decided to give a few hints or a few suggestions. For instance, if we look at SDG 6 um, about water and uh, target 6.6, .6, that is dedicated to protecting and restore water related ecosystems. For instance, we could use eventually the riparian zones product, which is also included in the priority air monitoring. So very similar to the Natura 2000, very detailed and based on VHR imagery. And one other, uh, and one other SDG that maybe could be addressed by CLMS data is SDG 11, dedicated to sustainable cities and communities. And there is one indicator called the uh, average share of the built up area of cities that is open space for public use. So the core of the, this indicator, which is 11.7.1 is open space for public use. So this is something we are looking into within urban access products to see if we can uh, devise or find a reasonable method for providing this kind of data that we can't see from above from the satellite, if it's a public space or not. Um, we're trying to look into this to see if in the future we keep, uh, we can fit into this indicator. And uh, with these suggestions, I conclude this presentation um, and I hope I could bring some clear information about CLMS products and eventually inspire some of you uh, working in the SDGs world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And I certainly hope that your presentation encourages people to uh, to join and to, to discover more about how CLMS can support sustainable development goals. Um, we now open the floor to the audience uh, for you to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, you can do so through Slido, through the Q&A. Uh, system that the Slido has, or you can also put your questions in the chat. Uh, whilst I give you some time to to share your questions, I I actually have um, some questions of my own for you, Anna, if you don't mind. Um, since based on on what you presented, um, it's clear that the sites, the Natura 2000 sites, um, are are in a in a better state than other than other regions where we see that the grasslands are, are more affected. Do you know if there are any uh, plans to ex extend the number of protected sites by Natura 2000? Well, I think the biodiversity strategy uh, is looking at increasing the number of uh, protected sites in Europe, so uh, reaching 30% of the area. So uh, I, I'm not sure I'm where we are now around 15 or 20 percent, maybe some someone in the audience knows better than I, but the, the, the intention is to grow. So there will be more protected areas in Europe in the future, for sure. That's, that's good to know. Um, and also, I, I was wondering, um, 
what if you could highlight which were the which are the greatest challenges that you face uh, when when studying the evolution of the grasslands well um we, we this exercise that we did is based on two periods with a limited number of sites so it's uh, if uh, if uh, i'm not sure how scientific i can call it but I think the challenge we are uh, uh, this product is facing is uh, that it's nowadays it's um, not not uh, good to have a product that is updated every six years and eventually move, we are moving to every three years. But in some cases could be enough, in others is not. So we know already that the environment is also trying to build a system much more dynamic of continuous monitoring of grassland sites to which our product contributes to a certain point to calibrate the continuous monitoring. So we, we are also looking into uh, some research projects uh, that uh, Euro, uh, Horizon Europe that are looking at to, um, how to go for a, a continuous monitoring of whatever could be grasslands or other habitats. So this is uh, the future for us. We cannot continue to, have, to offer products every six years. Mm -hmm. That's that's very interesting, and yes, it it would certainly be useful, I imagine, to to get more frequent um, studies rather than in in such a in, yeah, in such long periods. Yes. We have uh, one question uh, from the audience, which is: um, This uh, analysis is presented for Europe, but is it also available uh, in in a global scale through the Global Land Monitoring Service? No, this was just uh, one exercise that we did for a selection of sites. We didn't even cover all grass, all Natura 2000 sites that have some kind of grassland within, because our we could not find sufficient uh, v, uh, VHR imagery covering 2006, 12, and 18 to cover all possible sites. So we had to make a selection. So this is it, 4, 000, around 4,000 sites, and it's not, um, and of course, Natura 2000 is only in Europe, occurring only in, only in Europe. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and for answering all of our questions. Um, thank you. We're very happy that you participated uh, today. And now, before we move on to our next uh, presentation for the day, I would like to ask you another question on Slido, um, which is, how would you rate your knowledge about Copernicus? I, I'm sure that after Anna's presentation, it's much higher, but in any case, we, we would love to know. And now I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Tina Silovic. Uh, Tina has a PhD in marine science, and she has over 10 years of experience in ocean observation, gathered mainly through research activities around uh, phytoplankton communities and their spatiotemporal dynamics in relation to environmental conditions. She has recently, recently joined Mercator Ocean International, where one of her main duties is to increase user uptake of Copernicus marine data. Tina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sophia, for a nice introduction. And uh, I first want to also thank uh, for organizers to organizing this event and uh, also to thank Anna for the introduction into uh, sustainable development goals, because uh, that's one of the questions that I also had uh, before uh, making this presentation, how in depth uh, uh, or how we should start the presentation in relation to explaining uh, different Copernicus services and uh, also um, different uh, goals within uh, sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, so uh, my presentation is going to be about uh, how Copernicus Marine um, is advancing sustainable development of the ocean. So with the first slide, uh, thank you, first slide, please. Next slide, <laughs> thank you. So, with this slide, um, uh, that is basically presenting graphical abstract of uh, one um, scientific article of one of my colleagues, uh, Karina von Schuchman, uh, that went out uh, two years, uh, three years ago, actually, in a Marine Policy Journal. Um, I can uh, send you the link to this article, and I encourage anyone uh, to read it. It's not really hard uh, science, so it's really nicely uh, explaining uh, how the ocean 
uh, relates in, uh, uh, in SDGs. And um, one of these goals, uh, as Anna mentioned, there are 17 of them. It's life below water. And this is where uh, Copernicus Marine Service relates uh, obviously the most. So with this slide, I just want to remind you about uh, this life below water SDG and uh, remind you also how, uh, how critical to our uh, shared future, future and uh, humanity it is uh, to know um, um, about the ocean and how much uh, our lives depend on it. So consequently, to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas and marine resource is really important for sustainable development uh, in general. But um, for that, we need uh, what, what is required to, sustain, to sustainable development and between oceans too is uh, um, the required thing is that we have informed approach to support society and economy, and we need to gather the best available science, data and services, uh, which will all together provide us with a holistic approach uh, to achieve the vision of UN uh, decade, which is the science we need for the future we want. Um, next slide, please. So this is also yet another um, uh, yet another graphical um, visual um, uh, abstract take, take, taken from the from the already mentioned paper, and here you can see the the role of ocean monitoring uh, in society and economy and related value chain. So here on the on the bottom you can see that uh, environmental monitoring and uh, reporting uh, it's necessary um, for society because it, it they turn the it turns the raw data. Uh, and scientific knowledge into products that can be uh, used as value-added solutions, meaning reports, ocean indicators, evidence bases. And then uh, this is used by agencies and report bodies, and uh, it's delivered to end users uh, to support the national uh, and international decisions in, in achieving SDGs, and uh, by that yielding um, altogether societal uh, eco and, and economic uh, benefit. Next slide, please. So to explain you a bit more about this value chain uh, in ocean data uptake, so we have upstream, downstream, and, uh, and end user part. And upstream part is where the Copernicus Marine uh, services. So it's not only service. So it's a uh, uh, so you have this raw data. You need to have infrastructure and technical capac uh, capacities uh, for pre-processing of the data. Uh, and then um, we call it um, so. Mercator Ocean International uh, to that point is uh, basically implementer of such a data because it's uh, helping to turn this data uh, into something that is possible to use by, uh, by other users. And then you have downstream part and downstream users are the ones who are adding value to this data. So basically they're transforming data into applications that are required by end users. And they are the ones who are uh, presenting critical role in uh, enabling the socioeconomic impact of the data uh, across uh, broader uh, economy and society. And they're turning the data into something, uh, adding value to this data, uh, to something that direct users can uh, can use uh, and comprehend. And end users are, it's actually all of us, uh, but mainly in this point, I'm um, referring to governments and public institutions or uh, policy makers. So they can ha have informed uh, decision that uh, that are influencing all of us at the end. Next slide, please. So Copernicus Marine Service is um, uh, if you go on the website, uh, it's um, it's an online catalog of uh, different uh, different ocean products. It has uh, over three hundred scientifically proven products, um, and the service is user driven. So we are con const constantly uh, collecting uh, user needs. Uh, about uh, making new products or making the products already exist a bit better. Um, it's um, the the important part is that the the format of the data is uh, is a common format, uh, net CDF, and it's open to three uh, twenty one upon uh, registration. Uh, but as I mentioned in the previous part, uh, the data um, is uh, basically it needs to go through this downstream part uh, to go into something valuable for uh, for anyone. Aside of the data, the, there is also other tools that are uh, that are provided by Copernicus Marine Service. So there are tools for visualizing visualization visualization of the data, uh, disregarding the, the level that you have. So we have Ocean Learn, uh, which is basically used by, by beginners, but then you have a bit advanced uh, levels 
where you can visualize uh, the data that um, in, in the time. Uh, we have ocean monitor uh, indicators uh, that are free downloadable uh, trends uh, and data sets and uh, they're used to track the, the health signs of the ocean and changes that are happening, which is particularly important in the line of, uh, with the climate change. Ocean State Report is a, a bit extensive annual analysis, analysis of the state of the ocean. Uh, that uh, that it's um, there is also like a kind of an abstract of it, so you don't really need to read all of it. Um, and then we go back to the uh, to the ocean products um, that are uh, used to describe the the state of the ocean, because altogether Copernicus Marine is providing this systematic reference information on the physical state, but also variability and dynamics of the ocean and uh, uh, mar marine ecosystems in general. Next slide, please. So uh, to sum up the portfolio, because there are, as I said, 300 products, so I'm not going to go all, uh, through all of them. Uh, there are different marine variables that uh, that are part or that we can uh, thematically put them in blue, white or green ocean. So blue ocean is uh, explaining physics, white ocean is gathering information about ice and green ocean is around, uh, explaining biogeochemistry. Uh, this data is available in different uh, time frame formats. So multi-year, meaning 10 to 45 years. You have real uh, near real uh, near real time data that uh, goes down to hourly type of data, and then we also provide forecast ten to ten, uh, two to ten days, and observations are existing in situ data, meaning you have sensors that are taking the data uh, and providing the the information about the state of the ocean, but you also have satellite data. So this is combined, and this is also used to uh, to provide numerical models uh, that are giving us forecasts about the state of the ocean. And all this data is available for different uh, regions, uh, meaning global ocean, Arctic Ocean, Baltic Sea, uh, Mediterranean Sea, Black Sea, uh, and so on. Next slide, please. So when it, uh, we sum it up this, uh, I'm actually to explain you a bit more about uh, what do we mean by uh, blue, green, and white. Uh, so this is just example of the variables that you can find there. So. When we say uh, physics of the of the blue uh, blue ocean or the physics of it, variables included in there uh, are temperature, salinity, currents, waves. Green ocean would be uh, necton, plankton, uh, primary productivity, meaning chlorophyll uh, as a proxy of phytoplankton, uh, and white ocean would be uh, different variables that are uh, explaining and de describing the the ice. Next slide, please. And. Uh, with this slide, uh, I wanted to um, to refer to the uh, ocean's uh, multifaceted role in the in the SDG uh, framework, and um, basically uh, you can see it, uh, how everything is connected. And uh, environment uh, SDG 14 is one uh, one pa uh, part of the SDG that is uh, together with uh, SDG 13 and uh, and 15, which are describing uh, land and uh, and the uh, and climate uh, and referring to climate action, uh, they are the foundation for the uh, to support uh, society and economy. And uh, these three pillars of sustainability, economy, society, and environment were also inspiration for uh, for us. Next slide, I mean for Copernicus Marine Service uh, to come with the with these twelve markets um, and relate the, the 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 products and the service that we provide to environmental policies as well. So in the first column, you can see the it's the relation to the to the environment. Uh, the second one is society, and the last one is uh, is about economy. And uh, now my idea was to give you some of the examples of these downstream services that were developed uh, and that they relate to these three pillars of the um, uh, UN uh, SDGs. So next slide, please. Uh, so, my, uh, this is the way how uh, Copernicus Marine Service is supporting environment through conservation uh, because uh, provi uh, providing uh, basically key data to monitor um, marine uh, biodiversity and marine protected area. And uh, also it's here you can see several uh, different uh, variables that, uh, that are important, in, uh, important to uh, marine conservation and biodiversity. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the examples is uh, a wild, wildlife tracker for oceans. So, th so this is one of our use cases. 
And uh, here, so wild tra uh, wildlife tracker for uh, for oceans oceans is a cloud uh, geo framework uh, that provides a, a, a unique opportunity to overlay tracks of the of these uh, wild sharks, and uh, they are uh, they are doing this with uh, uh, in combination with biophysical data uh, to observe what is determining or what is affecting movement of these elements uh, of these animals. And um, so the type of the data they use is, for instance, chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is kind of proxy for phytoplankton. And where you have phytoplankton, you can find zooplankton, and zooplankton is considered the food of uh, of these uh, these animals. Um, the other uh, interesting variable is um, uh, sea temperature because uh, sea temperature uh, supports the habitat monitoring of these uh, animals, and basically they are affected by uh, changes in the in the in the temperature, particularly considering uh, heat waves and uh, all the changes that are happening with the with the sea temperature um, due to uh, climate crisis. And uh, all of this is uh, is um, um, is aligned with uh, target 14.2, which is focused on ocean protection and restoration because we know that we need healthy and productive uh, oceans. Next slide, please. Uh, to support society uh, through environmental policies, um, so Copernicus Marine Services are provide, providing uh, key data for uh, that are used uh, uh, in support of different um, different environmental environmental policies. Next slide, please. So the target fourteen point one uh, is the one that explains um, how we need to prevent and reduce marine pollution of all kinds. And uh, within this target, um, European Union has set uh, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive uh, that aims to improve the quality of European sea, uh, sea waters uh, by uh, looking and tackling the problem of plastic pollution. Uh, I don't need to go further in the problem of plastic pollution. I think we are all aware of it. But one of the use, uh, cases and one of the examples is um, uh, by using of Copernicus marine data is uh, this uh, use case of uh, floating marine litter tracking. And this uh, service um, is providing a solution um, uh, by uh, tracking the, the, the marine pollution and also uh, trying to predict where it's going to uh, predict its movement. So they're using uh, in situ and satellite uh, imagery and ocean currents to feed their solution and uh, provide uh, predictive uh, models. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so we, the Copernicus Marine Service is also supporting economy uh, through sust sustainable uh, exploitation. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to that end, I would like to present uh, Umitron Pulse, which is uh, one of the use cases. Uh, it's a web-based uh, service for monitoring uh, ocean environmental data. And what it does is that uh, it provides uh, aquacultures a uh, way to regularly monitor uh, changing water conditions. And changing water conditions is something that is important for uh, for um, for the animals living in the, in such a, such environment. And uh, they're also helping farmers to make key decisions when to feed them or uh, when to maybe, uh, or how to manage uh, risks that are coming from the environment, uh, like uh, high water temperatures. So again, we are on, uh, on the topic of the heat waves, or for instance, uh, harmful algal blooms, where they would probably need to move the cages because uh, these blooms, um, this alg algae can be really toxic for the, for the animals. Or if we are talking about shells, um, uh, they are filter feeders, so basically they are going to uh, consist uh, uh, consist uh, toxic toxins of the algae, and then if they are not cleaned, uh, they can uh, cause some problems in uh, humans if they are uh, eating them. Uh, and with this slide, uh, I'm going to finish my presentation. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what Copernicus Marine Data can do, and uh, there are many, many more use cases that uh, that already exist. Uh, uh, but we also hope there are going to be many more uh, to come in a, in a future days. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tina, for this extremely interesting presentation. And we actually already have some questions. So uh, before we open the floor uh, to to the audience, um, the first question that we have is: uh, You mentioned some alignment with targets, but is there a concrete indicator that you support with the marine services? Um, you mean by the by the tar uh, targets that are indicated on the slides of the use cases, or? Uh... 
Um, I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure that the I, uh... person asking is not uh, clarifying. Mainly, they can they can clarify in in the chat so that you can answer their question. In the meantime, otherwise, I don't. I don't see any any clarification in the chat. But please do do clarify so that we can answer your your question. Uh, but yes, in the meantime, yes. otherwise, I, um, we have another question, which is. Uh, do you have contacts either with the custodian agency, UNEP, or countries who are reporting to the UN? Uh, not to not to my knowledge. Um, I mean, there, there are many there are many different uh, initiatives, but we are not um, directly connected. There are, there are many different ways that we are that we are helping, and there are many different um, also parts of the of the Mercator Ocean International. Uh, we also have a scientific directive and. Uh, one of the persons who are really uh, the mostly uh, connected to sustainable development goals topic is uh, my colleague uh, who, who wrote this uh, article that I was mentioning, Karina von Schuchman. Uh, so probably anything around uh, how the Copernicus Marine data, uh, how ser uh, Copernicus Marine Service is uh, helping, uh, uh, she would uh, she would know much much more uh, than me actually. Um. Yeah, I see um, a comment in the chat um, clarifying there are goals, targets, and indicators. Uh, the indicators are the most concrete measurements used for the reporting. Exactly. Um, again, if there are any any more questions, please feel free to to share them. Um, in in the meantime, I I have a question. Maybe it's a, a silly question, but you mentioned that. Um, the different um, marine variables that, that you check. So you have uh, this uh, multi-year uh, checks. Uh, there's also real-time uh, checks and there's also the forecast. So I was wondering, do you, do you have these three options for all the marine variables that you study or is it just some? And if it's just some, what, what makes them um, only available in, in one of the of the different categories. Uh, well, it's not. Uh, this is not basically. Uh, this is not done in terms of decision that we decide uh, which ones are going to be available because the the whole system about feeding the data is uh, is a quite complex. There are many institutions that are considered as producers of different data, and then uh, there is also um, when when the products are um, are um, are made. Let's say that way. There is also the procedure of to to validate them if they are going to be useful. That's why the whole uh, service needs to be user driven. There are also many calls that are defined. Uh, we call them uh, evolution uh, calls uh, or R&D uh, calls that are basically making the service better, which also goes in line with uh, with what, what is uh, what is in general uh, in general needed. But uh, to to go more specific on your on your question, um, yes, most of the most of the data uh, is. Uh, Existing uh, for uh, for most of the variables, uh, the data exists for uh, for different uh, different periods of the time and different uh, geographic regions. Um, there are obviously some um, some type of data is much easier to obtain. Like uh, in general, when we talk about physical uh, state of the ocean, this data is much more valuable because uh, you have uh, much easier. Uh, how to say the the sensors are. Uh, um, in situ sensors that they derive data much more quickly than, for instance, biological data, and particularly because any type of model uh, that includes biological data also need to be uh, validated from in situ data, and uh, this is a bit more going into complexity. So I would say that uh, biological data is always the one that is uh, hardest to obtain, uh, so to say. I see. Thank you very much for the the detailed uh, answer. Um... And we have just one last question, and then uh, unfortunately we have to end the the Q and A, so that we have time for a next presentation. Um, but we have a question here, which is maybe I lost something. Um, uh, who is Umitron, releaser of the app, or is it is it you, or is it a private company? Yeah, this is a, a private company. Um, uh, so basically, the thing is, uh, Copernicus Marine is uh, is a service. I mean, it's an open data for anyone. So. 
uh, which means that anyone for public sector, uh, research sector, uh, governments, anyone can use it and do the, the with data what uh, basically what they want. So obviously there are like scientific articles that are uh, doing some research study. There are some uh, reports that are helping policymakers, but there are also um, there is a big usage of industry sector and business sector. So uh, different uh, SMEs that are turning the the data into something that helps them to get uh, to get profit. So this is one example of it. So from our point of view, um, uh, we like the data that the data is used, uh, however it's used. So for in this sense, uh, it, it, it's not it is not uh, uh, us. We didn't have anything to do with that, but uh, providing the data. I think that clears everything up. <laughs> so thank you very much, Tino, once again for for this presentation and for answering all all the questions. You're welcome. And before we go to our third presentation of the day, uh, we have another question on Slido for you. Uh, we're curious to know what brought you to this webinar on Copernicus for monitoring and measuring the impact of sustainable uh, development goals policies. Um, and now uh, we have our next speaker, uh, Michele Melchiorri. Uh, Michele is project officer for Copernicus Global Human Settlement Layer at the European Commission uh, Joint Research Center. Uh, his main responsibilities include supporting the integration of the production of the global human settlement layer data into the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. Uh, previously, he has worked as analyst at the Joint Research Center, contributing to the uptake of the degree of urban, urbanization method with UN Habitat, and published scientific papers on sustainable development goals, monit monitoring with uh, global human settlement uh, layer data. Uh, Michele has also cooperated with international organizations, including the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, the World Bank, and other NGOs for research and projects in the field of sustainable urban development, uh, housing, and urban planning. Uh, he has a master's in international public affairs from the Luis Guido Carli University and a master's degree in urban planning and territorial policy from Politecnico di Milano. Uh, Michele. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Sofia, for the kind introduction and also for uh, inviting us from uh, the GRC to this uh, uh, webinar. The GRC is the Science and Knowledge Service of the European Commission, and we are tasked to provide uh, independent scientific evidence for policy making. We are also in charge of running the Copernicus Emergency Management Service, of which the Global Human Settlement Layer is a new uh, component. So in this presentation, I would like to set the scene on, uh, yes, the SDGs, but also on the thematic agreements that were negotiated during 2015 and 16 that cover also disaster risk reduction, climate change, and the new urban agenda. And all those frameworks are, let's say, uh, connected by uh, essential information on human settlements to know where people live, how many they are, in which condition they live, and how those settlements are evolving. Um, the Copernicus Emergency Management Service is uh, producing uh, information on uh, human settlements through the exposure mapping component, the global human settlement layer, but also takes care uh, of all the phases of uh, disaster risk management from preparedness, response, and recovery, to, to several components like uh, rapid mapping, risk and recovery, uh, flood monitoring, uh, U European and global fire, uh, forest fire uh, monitoring system, and also uh, drought observatories. The GHSL contributes uh, exposure information to these uh, components by uh, providing data on population and, and built up areas. The uh, global human settlement layer is a suite of uh, data and tools uh, that uh, exactly monitor uh, the presence of uh, population on the planet. So it has global coverage and also provide information in time series. So over time, we cover a time span ranging from uh, 2030 back to uh, 1975 with some uh, short range uh, projection. Those data are essential for understanding the interaction between human and the environment, 
uh, but also uh, on ecosystems and also for human access uh, to uh, resources. The exposure mapping component is essential to understand and manage uh, disaster risk because uh, disaster risk is uh, uh, based on a hazard component that can be, for example, a floodplain area, so areas that could be inundated, uh, vulnerability, but also exposure. So uh, people and buildings that can be impacted in case of, of a flood. And uh, knowing the presence and characteristics of, uh, of those people is essential to uh, carefully manage disaster risk. And most of all, it's important to have global coverage because in our experience, we have found that there are very different uh, capacity in, in understanding uh, the exposure of people. So the GHSL with its global data provide a baseline that is uh, good and free and open for, for everyone. The main features of the GHSL, as I mentioned, are a very long time series ranging 1975 to 2030 with layers every five years. So uh, interpolation of five years uh, intervals, so 1980, 1985, and so on, and they have a high spatial resolution. So thanks to Copernicus Sentinel satellites, we managed to uh, map buildings and uh, at 10 meter uh, spatial resolution. And based on that, we combine this information with population data to provide population grids at 100 meter. Another key characteristic is that we classify built-up uh, surfaces in residential and non-residential uses, um, and these open a wide range uh, of applications. We also uh, recently started mapping the uh, third dimension, so we provide building height uh, estimation that leads to the production of built-up uh, volumes. We see in this uh, synthetic slide the portfolio of, of products that the GHSL uh, produces. We are in the area of uh, Kinshasa, uh, so we are in Africa here, and we uh, move from left to the right, first with the built-up surface fraction, uh, with a gradient from black to, uh, to yellow, where the built-up density per pixel at 10 meter increases. Then uh, in the second, uh, image from the left uh, uh, built up a volume estimation, then uh, mapping of settlement characteristics, so combining uh, the heights of buildings with open spaces and also the presence of green areas. And then we produce a population grid that is uh, basically counting uh, inhabitants per grid cell of 100 meter. And then we combine uh, built up uh, surfaces, population density, into a settlement classification that is the degree of urbanization. The degree of urbanization is uh, uh, recommended as a methodology for international statistical comparison of uh, urban and rural areas. The uh, characteristics of uh, Copernicus uh, GHSL is a continuous update. So every second year uh, there is uh, starting from uh, this year, the call for tender just closed in, uh, in October. There will be a periodic release for uh, the year 2022, release in 2024, and then uh, release 24 and 2026. Um, those are flexible products, meaning that we produce uh, 10 meter built up fraction uh, layers, but also population grid and settlement classification, but also intermediate products like uh, uh, imagery that were used to produce the layers, training and reference data, but also uh, greenness based on NDVI in the uh, built-up uh, layer. In terms of uh, applications uh, to SDGs, we certainly have a core domain in SDG 11 uh, on uh, sustainable uh, cities and communities. And in the past, we have done uh, works on uh, uh, the estimation of indicator 11.3.1 on uh, the ratio between uh, land consumption rate and the uh, population growth rate. We have done this at global level uh, in, uh, in urban centers. So basically the cities, the, the settlements with at least 50,000 people that were outlined based on, uh, on the degree of urbanization. And at global level, we have found that uh, the rate of uh, spatial expansion is uh, significantly higher than the one of population growth in uh, the majority uh, of the world. So in this case, we see only 
some uh, green dots that correspond to population densification, so rates of uh, population growth higher than, uh, than built-up area expansion. Then we have done the same analysis at the functional urban area level, uh, again at the global level, and also in this case we uh, significantly um, found that uh, also in functional urban areas the rate of spatial expansion is higher than the one of population growth, and there is no significant relationship between the size of the urban center, that is uh, the core of the FUA, and uh, the efficiency of, uh, of the FUA itself. Uh, there, are, there is a scientific paper below with uh, extensive analysis and, and details for, for your curiosity. Then, on the basis of uh, the uh, urban centers, we also uh, computed an estimation of SDG 11.6.2, together with the GRC colleague of the uh, EDGAR database, so emission and uh, anthropogenic emission database. Uh, we did this also, again, in a multi-temporal way, so for 1975 up until uh, 2015, and we have found a significant shift in the location of, of pollutions from Europe in, back in the days, where it's now uh, declining, while in, uh, East, uh, in East Asia is uh, significantly uh, increasing. And also, we cannot see from this map, but there is also a, um, a significant transition between sectors, with the transport sector uh, being responsible for a significant share of the emission. Um, I can be quite quick here on SDG 11 uh, 7.2, on uh, uh, access to uh, green and public spaces, with remote sensing, we cannot really uh, see if a space is public, but certainly we can see uh, or detect if it is uh, uh, green, so based on NDVI. And here on the right, we see a specific uh, snapshot of uh, Buenos Aires with the um, 30 meter uh, NDVI at pixel level. So we see significant disparities in the presence of greenness within cities, and this directly relates to a set of uh, additional uh, metrics like uh, temperature, uh, humidities, and, and many other indicators. And then on the larger map, we can see the proportion of the population living in uh, areas of high green. So we cross the population grid and the NDVI to understand uh, how many people were living per urban center in areas of high or, or low greenness. Uh, a last bit of uh, application to SDG is the degree of uh, urbanization that was exactly developed to uh, make international comparison possible on all those indicators that required urban and rural uh, disaggregation. Because urban and rural areas, the, the definition of urban and rural areas is very different across uh, uh, countries, and thus the, let's say, the comparison of, of indicators was, uh, was a bit at risk. So by defining urban and rural areas in a common and harmonized way, it is possible to uh, disaggregate those statistics in a, in a comparable way. We see here three charts on uh, SDG2 on the proportion of uh, population with food insecurity for, for some countries. In the middle, um, the share of, uh, let's say, of um, infant death per uh, thousand people related to SDG3. And then on the last chart, the, the share of households with access to water and sanitation in cities, towns, semi-dense areas, and rural areas. And in all those charts, we see a significant gradient, uh, with cities usually offering uh, better performance and uh, uh, lower performances in, in rural areas. In the Eurostat manual on the application of uh, the degree of urbanization, there are uh, several examples of uh, SDG disaggregation that is basically uh, done in a way that territorial units for which uh, indicators are uh, uh, collected are classified by degree of urbanization, and then basically we produce pivot table of, uh, of this uh, disaggregation. I'd like to uh, move towards the end by saying that uh, GHSL is uh, serving uh, several international policy frameworks uh, GHSL data supported findings in the uh, Global Environmental Outlook 6 uh, by UNEP. We were uh, also featured in uh, SDG uh, 11 synthesis uh, report, also in the uh, metadata of 1131, in uh, the training, um, training course by 
you an habitat on the calculation of SDG 11.3.1, and also some of the findings about exposure of people were taken up by the IPCC sixth assessment report. Other activities uh, or contribution are in the global assessment report, in the future of cities again by UN Habitat, but also on the SDG voluntary local review uh, handbook that is produced by GRC to help uh, local authorities in uh, monitoring SDG at a very fine, uh, very specific uh, territorial level. Uh, I invite you to have a look at our uh, website. Um, it's, uh, it's mentioned here where you can freely download the geospatial data to uh, start uh, doing your analysis, feeding your models and uh, reporting uh, statistics and uh, writing papers. With this, I thank you very much and I revert back to Sofia. Thank you. Michele, thank you very much for, for your very interesting presentation. And we actually have already uh, one question. As always, we open the floor uh, for this Q&A part. Um, the, the first question that we have, I think you've partially answered with your last uh, slide, actually, but is, uh, do you know if your information is picked up by UN custodians or national SDG reporting? Yes, we have a solid and continuous uh, dialogue, especially with uh, UN Habitat, which is the custodian of uh, SDG 11. Uh, Thomas and I were in the call, uh, contributed to several expert group meeting on SDG 11. And we are really trying also to build a lot of capacity at country level in the framework of this uh, degree of urbanization project to really explain to uh, national statistical uh, offices uh, how to use uh, GHSL data and tools to define urban areas and also to start reporting SDG uh, by degree of urbanization. I, I see we have uh, another question, but it's actually quite simple, which is, uh, will the slides be available uh, for for our uh, attendees? And the answer is yes, we will be sharing them on the website for the event. We will make sure that you, you get all the information. Um, and before we leave you, because I, I know we're over time, um, but uh, what what do you see as the next um, steps for GHSL? So, indeed, uh, the Copernicus Emergency Management Service is uh, going to ensure a, a timely, high quality and periodical uh, production of uh, this data set. So this is uh, something that is uh, essential for uh, monitoring uh, the SDGs. So from, from uh, now until uh, 2030, there are a lot of statistics and indicators to be reported. And then the second probably direction is uh, going to be in the classification and uh, characterization of, uh, of human settlements. So uh, beyond, uh, let's say, uh, residential and non-residential areas, but to refine also the vertical component and maybe establishing a time series of, uh, of uh, heights and building volumes. Uh, I did not have time in the presentation, but we also have an additional product that is named the Urban Center Database, which is basically, um, we take the 10,000 cities in their uh, polygons, basically, and then we um, basically provide attributes like uh, PM2, uh, emission and concentration, uh, population density, population size, and so many other uh, variables. We have around 120 for now. Um, and next year, we would like to, to provide an update of, uh, of this database that is multi-thematic and uh, multi-temporal. Yes. Interesting to hear. And we have one final question. Um, they they mentioned that um, they mentioned the recent landslide of Ischia and uh, that EMS uh, immediately uh, performed rapid mapping of the area and they are interested in knowing if GH cell was also involved. Um, let's see. As part of uh, risk and uh, recovery and rapid mapping, we are in general uh, used. But for specific uh, activation, maybe uh, there are uh, VHR uh, imagery acquired, and then Thomas can be more uh, precise on this uh, specific activation. Yeah, um, 
Hello, I'm, I'm uh, Thomas Kemper. I'm, I'm working also with Michaela on, on the GHSL uh, data production. Our data sets are already included uh, in the production workflow of all the, the rapid mapping uh, activities, hence they, they do a first check. However, um, as Michaela presented, we have a spatial resolution of 100 meter. And uh, in Ischia, we were also for the first time uh, using uh, uh, drones and, and airborne uh, data with, with uh, 50 centimeter spatial resolution. Hence, in, in such situation, we, we are really coming uh, to the limits of the applicability of our population uh, data. Um, so they, they were not used there. Instead, there was information uh, coming from, from uh, um, the local administration that uh, could be taken into account. But overall, uh, the, the first uh, estimate is always uh, available with, with our data in, in more large scale applications. Thank you very much for, for your answer. And I see that the person who asked is also thanking you. Um, so I don't want to take any more of your time. I thank you, uh, Michele and Thomas, again uh, for this presentation and for answering all the questions. And now we're reaching the end of this sixth uh, Copernicus webinar. I want to thank again all of the speakers uh, for such interesting and engaging presentations and to thank you, the audience, for your participation and for all your questions. Uh, we hope that you learned something new today about how Copernicus can be used for monitoring and measuring the impact of sustainable development policies. And if you have any other questions or comments, uh, please uh, contact the Copernicus uh, support office. You should see right now our uh, email and how you can follow us on social media. Um, before you leave, also, we have one final question on Slido. Uh, we would love to know how useful you have found uh, the content of this webinar today. And uh, thanks again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. And have a nice day. See you next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.